All right. Good job. Thanks. All right. So the other piece that I want to point out to you all is that this link here is our website uh, where we will be posting information from time to time. And so this is the information here. If you got to the webinar, you've gotten to this website. So just bookmark this website by pressing Control D. Okay. So common sense is a trusted guide for the family, educators, and advocates who help kids thrive online. They provide resources around media, technology, and public policy. I am Alfred Toole, a learning technology integrator at Western Albemarle and also at Murray Community High School. And I am also co-presenting with the fabulous librarian, May Craddock. Hey, everybody. As we, thanks, May, for saying hello. <laughs> I want to point out to everyone that we are not experts, but we are parents like you who want to be better prepared. I also want to point out Child Mind Institute. They are the only independent nonprofit organization that exclusively is dedicated to transforming mental health care for children everywhere. More than anything, we want our kids to be safe, healthy, and happy. But in the news, we see scary headlines around kids, media, and mental health. Although we can't completely solve this problem with a presentation, <laughs> We will walk you through information and tips you need to feel more prepared. Here's what we'll cover. Overall, research around this topic is new. So we'll examine what's out there and what we know is true. Then we'll look at your teen's brain to get some insight into what they're working with when they start using social media. Social media can be scary. So we'll look at some of the problems that do sometimes happen. And then we'll talk about the signs of suicide and self-harm so that we're armed with information and talk through a few case studies or role plays to apply what we've learned. And finally, we'll briefly look at the upsides of social media and gaming and talk about how to use media in a positive, balanced way. How many of you have seen a headline about social media or gaming tied to anxiety or depression? If you're like me or like most people, yes, those headlines seem to be multiplying as we start to look at the effects of, that the digital world is having on our kids. Though there's no truly definitive long-term research about the effects of social media and gaming on mental health, we can still piece together enough info to help our kids. Here are some of the stats that exist right now. Overall, number one, overall statistics between 13 and 20% of children in the US experience a mental health disorder in any given year. Two, increases in depression. There was a 33% increase in the number of eighth to 12th graders who had high levels of depressive symptoms from 2010 to 2015. And number three, the suicide rate is the second leading cause of death of people age 15 to 24. So there are definitely some concerning trends around kids' mental health. If you look at numbers four and five, you'll also notice that there's some research that says teens who spent five plus hours on devices were 66% more likely to have at least one suicide related outcome. Also, other research says that the data actually shows that social media only explains 0.36% of depressive symptoms. However, the link to digital media isn't entirely clear at this point. The stats often conflict with one another and it's not clear what's causing particular trends. And that's why we have number six that talks about the variables. There are just too many variables to say absolutely that digital media is a major cause of increased depression and anxiety. Though there is some correlation in terms of kids who spend more time on devices reporting more mental health issues than kids who spend more time off screen. Here's what we can say for sure. 
Teens who use screens the most are less happy than those who use a moderate amount. And those who use a moderate amount are happier than those who use none at all. Researchers call this the Goldilocks hypothesis. What does moderate mean though? That's the tricky part. There are no clear lines that teens shouldn't cross. It's more about how it fits into a balanced approach to everything else in their lives. If they're having fun with friends and family, pursuing outside interests, staying healthy, getting enough sleep, and doing okay in school, their use is probably in balance. It also matters what they use it for. Facebook's own research found that endless scrolling and liking with no interaction tends to make people unhappier. Also, teens who, you, who are digital status seekers tend to engage in riskier behavior online or excuse me, riskier behavior offline. Finally, there are a lot of variables that make it hard to nail down cause and effect. Kids who are unhappier overall have more negative outcomes using social media than kids who are happier offline. Lack of sleep is an often overlooked factor when it comes to mental health, but it is a powerful one. Ultimately, if digital media seems to be making your kid unhappy, then that's enough to go on. The research gives us some information, but let's take a look at what's happening in your kid's brain that might affect how digital media impacts them. First, it's important to know that the human brain isn't fully developed until about age 24. The prefrontal cortex, which helps make good decisions and prioritize, isn't done growing. You can think of it like an orchestra conductor that helps direct everything. Instead, tweens and teens use different parts of their brain called the ventral stratium, which isn't great at thinking through consequences. In the context of social media, that might mean posting a picture that's embarrassing to themselves or someone else. When it comes to gaming, that might mean playing all night instead of doing homework and getting enough sleep. They also tend to see situations as final and forever. That might mean that if someone makes a cool comment and someone else agrees, it might feel like an indisputable truth that everyone agrees with and that will never change. As tweens, they're developing the ability to see each other's perspectives, which is an important skill. However, with the increased focus on peer approval, it also means being preoccupied with what others think about them. Social media can play into insecurities around other people's opinions, as can in-game chat. So the bottom line around these brain facts is that when tweens and teens are set up for risk-taking, making quick decisions without thinking them through, seeking peer approval or being preoccupied with other people's opinions of them and seeing things as black and white in total truth, no end in sight. Since that's what kids are working with when we hand them smartphones, there are some potential impacts that social media and gaming can have on mental health. We'll approach them as four categories, comparison, pressure, drama, and isolation. One of the challenges, especially with social media, is comparing your insights to other people's carefully curated, posed, and filtered outsides. And since teen brains are already prone to feel vulnerable around what others think, the way they use social media can definitely impact how they feel about themselves. Some of the elements of social media that are trickiest have to do with appearances. It's easy to alter images with apps like Facetune 
or by using filters or Photoshop. If teens compare themselves to the pictures they see, they're likely trying to meet a false standard that no one can achieve. And teens compare themselves both to peers and celebrities, which sets them up for different levels of false standards. And as many of you know from using Facebook, the majority of pictures we see are all <laughs> smiling faces, pretty faces, and fun times. No one's life is perfect, but it's hard to know that by looking at some people's feeds. Social media, YouTube, and even video games can serve up a lot of content and images of beauty ideals, tutorials, and products. It all seems to boil down to what you look like is most important which is a hard message for an insecure teen. There's tons of sexy, scantily clad content out there. And teens may even start to see their own friends sharing sexy pictures. As teens explore their own sexuality, it can be tricky to resist the urge to put it on display when they see too much of it. It's also hard for them not to compare themselves with friends who may be doing just that. Online, online feedback is often swift and harsh, whether you are on social media or a game with a chat. If you get likes, that may reinforce posting more of the same. If you get negative comments, it can be crushing especially if there's judgment about appearance. There are a lot of feelings that come from these beliefs. They may feel like everyone else knows what they're doing and is having the best time all the time. They may feel like they just aren't attractive enough. Social media can reinforce body image issues that already exist. One study, the Fredrickson study in 1998, found that women performed worse on a math test while wearing a bathing suit than while wearing a sweater, which may indicate that the way we see ourselves can impact our performance and confidence. If teens work hard to look perfect online, they may start to believe that no one will like their imperfect selves. Getting likes and online approval can become very important as a measure of self-worth. So what do we do? First, it's critical that the feelings your teens has around comparing themselves to others are real and they can't be swept away with the simple, you're pretty, or don't worry about what other people think. Starting with empathy and validation can be powerful so your kids feel seen. I know it's really hard when it seems like everyone looks good and has it together. And it's also true that these pictures are just one piece of the puzzle and comparing our whole selves to one piece does not add up. If you're having trouble with this, here's one way to relate. Imagine you have a coworker who has the same position as you and seems to be perfect. They're attractive, sharply dressed, and cool. Not only that, but they seem to do a perfect job all the time. Your boss constantly praising them day in, day out, and that's what you see and hear. That's a bit what social media can feel like to a teen, an unattainable standard always on display. Duck syndrome isn't a strange illness resulting in web sleep. Stanford researchers coined the phrase when describing how a duck is swimming. It looks effortless from above the surface when underneath the duck's feet are frantically pedaling. It's helpful to remind teens that someone's life may look effortless, but everyone has struggles and insecurities. If your child is still unconvinced, 
take a look at some of the content they're viewing and put a live to it. Kardashians, plastic surgery, makeup artists, careful curation, and well-publicized unhappiness. There are also YouTube and social media influencers who keep it real and make imperfection a priority. So see if your kid knows about them. If friends are the ones courting perfection, your student probably likely knows that it's an illusion and maybe even what methods they use to try and achieve it. Talk about the pros and cons of that approach. How much energy does it take to maintain that illusion? Do the benefits go beyond just likes? Modeling how to struggle, make mistakes, and be imperfect helps your kid deal with it too. If they see us trying to be perfect, they may take that pressure on themselves as well. Instead of only emphasizing positive outcomes, it's important to praise effort, even if they don't succeed. Working towards something and learning from the experience, even when it ends in failure, is how kids build, resi build resilience and work through perfectionism. Remind teens that despite the social media illusions of physical perfection and happiness, the reality is that everyone has insecurities, sometimes struggle, and is imperfect. We can help them use digital media to communicate and to connect rather than compare and despair. The next potential pitfall is pressure. Though these challenges affect everyone because tween and teen brains have less ability to prioritize and make good decisions. They're even more vulnerable to the addictive qualities of technology and the always on nature of digital media. It's tricky for adults to balance being reachable 24 seven. So it's even more challenging for teens. And many of the apps and games we use are designed to keep us using them, checking them and playing them. Some of the biggest issues are getting an almost constant influx of communication in many different forms. Snaps, texts, chats, posts, just like back in the day when the phone would ring and we'd run to pick it up. Teens today feel like they need to respond right away because letting too much time go by sends its own message. I'm mad or I don't care. In fact, 72% of teens in the US feel the need to respond immediately to online communications. In the midst of all this information being flung around, it's easy to feel that if you don't keep up, you'll miss out. So if there's a group chat and you're not responding, you may miss a new inside joke or some important gossip that everyone will be referencing. Those compelling red notifications, numbers, the dopamine rush of likes and follows, autoplay, in-app purchases for in-game rewards, and constantly updating feeds are all techniques companies use to keep us hooked. No matter what your kid is into, scrolling, posting, playing, watching, there is some sticky science at play trying to keep them tied to their screen. When someone likes one of your posts, do you feel obligated to like theirs? For teens, social media can be an extension of friendship. So liking something online does mean something. Snap streaks, a series of Snapchat pictures volleyed back and forth between two people, are another example of this unspoken social contract that teens feel that they must maintain or they're letting the other person down. Kids, making, kids playing multiplayer games also feel this if they're part of a guild or a group so they're supposed to do a raid or play at a level at a certain time. It feels important that they participate and disappoint their team. Not only can we not quite keep up with the Kardashians, but also we can't stay on top of our social media feeds. If kids only use Snapchat and Instagram, that's already a bunch of communication and news to stay up on. And it can start to feel like a full-time job. Trying to keep up with a digital social life and get schoolwork done can often lead to multitasking. Often we talk about multitasking as an important skill and something to value, but research actually shows trying to do more than one thing at a time just um, decreases performance on those tasks. It's important for teens to know that 
if they feel like they can chat, text, scroll, swipe, do homework at the same time, something will suffer. Spoiler alert, it is probably their homework. Just saying. Research on mice around overstimulation by screens show impacts on learning and lasting brain changes. On the one hand, these changes in the brain appear to be helpful in fast-paced, stressful environments, but they also seem to affect the conditions required to learn moving forward. How much of this applies to humans is unclear for many reasons, including the fact that flashing lights used in the study don't really mimic a game or show that it's meaning to a kid. But it could underline the fact that overstimulation can negatively impact learning. It gets even trickier when kids have to use screens for school. It can make it easier to hide multitasking if they're opening multiple tabs to check social media, using a chat platform, playing games between homework problems. And if grades drop because of their divided attention, it can lead to frustration and even anxiety or depression if the problem worsens or persists. The more teens feel pressured to stay in touch and in the know, the less time they have for other things like sleep. Unfortunately, lots of teens already struggle with sleep because of early school start times and busy schedules. Constant connection can complicate things further. Though the impact of blue light from phones tablets and TVs might not be as significant as one's thought, it's still worth considering, especially for teens. More concerning is staying up late to scroll, text, and chat, since the pressure to keep up and stay in touch can be powerful. As we all know from when our kids were newborns, not getting sleep can really affect one's health outlook and performance at work or school. Not getting enough sleep can also contribute to mental health problems like depression. How, oops, excuse me again, lost my spot. It's it hard, hard to feel to like, feel. thanks man, there you go. Okay, got it. It's hard to feel like you can't. Sorry, you guys, Alfred muted himself. <laughs> hey, so there you go about perfection. Uh, so you, we won't have that today, here you go. All right, so um, going back to how to help, um, well, let me back up a slide actually. I think I'm, I got ahead of myself. Okay, so let me back up. So we're gonna deal with this one, effects on call communication. All right, so it's hard to feel like you can't keep up and it's pretty compelling to see your likes and follows climb. They may feel like it's critical to stay on top of the news, celebrities or other information that's important to their social group, or they won't be included and have FOMO, fear of missing out. They might feel that if they don't hold up their end of the digital social contract by liking posts, maintaining snap streaks, playing with their gaming team, et cetera, that people will be mad and they'll be replaced. When those little red numbers climb, they may feel like there could be something important waiting. Also, if people are liking their post, there's a positive rush that's hard to resist. How do we help our kids feel less pressured? Again, it's important not to dismiss or minimize their feelings of FOMO or responsibility. As their feelings are real and legitimate, even if we don't totally understand. If you're having trouble understanding, here's one way to relate. Imagine your doorbell rings, then it rings again. And again, then your phone, 
rings. Then there's a knock on your back door. And one of those things could be important or none of them are. You just don't know. And you know a prize is coming, but not when or how. But if you miss it, it'll be gone and your family will be disappointed. That's a bit how it feels. Though this might be tricky for some teens, encourage them to turn off notifications. Or at least downgrade to a less intrusive version. In settings, they can turn off in settings, they can turn off notifications completely. Or they can downgrade from sounds and banners and every bell and whistle to one type. Or maybe they can pick one app to get notifications for or let friends know that it's really important. They should text because they won't be checking every notification they get. Keeping devices away from the dinner table and out of the bedroom can help your kids contain the urge to keep checking. Though kids may need a computer for homework, they probably don't need their phones. Have your teen get into the habit of either putting their phone in another room while doing schoolwork or using an app designed to keep kids focused like Forest. Stay focused, be present. If your kid wants to listen to music at bedtime, you may be able to use the device controls to make sure that that's all they do. If not, an old fashioned alarm clock and a charging station in another room might help your teen get to sleep on time. It also helps if they can put the blame on you. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't answer you, you right away, but my mom won't let me have my phone after 9 p.m. The way you use your device is really important as your kid will definitely call you out if you tell them one thing and do another. If you struggle with all that sticky social media, be upfront about it and challenge each other to resist and set limits. If you're using your phone as a tool for work, shopping lists, et cetera, tell your kid what you're doing so they know you're not just scrolling. Myth or truth? Parents spend less time on devices than kids or teens. When it comes to being a good role model, think about it. What, what do parents do? Here's the answer. Parents spend nine hours and 22 minutes, including for personal and work use. Seven hours and 43 minutes of that time is devoted to personal screen time. Tweens spend an average of six hours per day and teens on average spend about nine hours a day on their screens. Ultimately, we're feeling that pressure and pleasure too as parents. So moderating our own use can really help our teens find balance. If you have a teen or a tween that you are, you're likely familiar with drama, but being behind a keyboard can sometimes mean especially bad behavior because of something called disinhibition effect. When we aren't face to face with someone we say and do things that we might not otherwise. And because teens play out some of their social lives online, there's bound to be some drama. There are subtle and not so subtle ways for teen drama to play out online. There have always been friendship flips, mean girls and bullies, but being online can take it to new levels. 
Of course, we know that kids can be mean sometimes, but what's different is that the online world amplifies and accelerates mean comments, rumors, and embarrassing information and pictures. Imagine a burn book where people wrote notes about classmates and passed it around. Now that burn book is accessible 24 seven to everyone in the school and beyond. And what's written about you is permanent. While some online drama stems from a misunderstanding of some kind, there's also deliberate cyberbullying, which is targeted, prolonged online attacks meant to cause harm. About 15% of kids are electronically bullied in comparison to 18 to 31% who experience in-person bullying. The drama can also involve romantic relationships. So if someone starts asking for sexy pictures, it might feel like you need to comply or you'll lose the interest of that person. Once you send one, there are usually requests for more. And all too often, these pictures are shared with other people. Let's watch a video from AT&T's film, There's a Soul Behind That Screen, to hear from some teens. I got cyberbullied in the beginning of 10th grade. And this girl was posting anonymous comments on my pictures saying how I was ugly and fat and was, she would send me texts about how she saw me in the hallway and I didn't look good that day or something about my appearance and she always had a nasty comment to say. I always get body shamed um, for being thick or being too big. So easy to send a photo of yourself, you know, you might trust somebody but end up not being a trustworthy person. Even if it's behind their back, it's, you know, it's still cyberbullying, it's hurt, it's hurtful. One time I posted a picture and I got like, it was like, oh, like, you're totally gay, like, that's so gay, and it was like, okay. And then like, they kept commenting. I was FaceTiming her and like, maybe something that I shouldn't have been, and she took a screenshot of me and sent it to a bunch of people at my school. I felt like hurt at first because when somebody's saying a bunch of mean things to you, it kind of gets to you, even though you're taught not to worry about everybody else's opinion. Like I started questioning whether or not I should even keep my social media accounts because all of this negativity is just like held within it. Last year, I didn't want to go to school um, because of a person saying things online. I didn't even like want to go outside. Oh, I didn't want to spend time with like friends because um, because I thought I was like fat or, so yeah. As we heard from several teens in the video, there are lots of feelings that come along with the drama. Teens might feel like they can't face humiliation of going to school and seeing everyone if there has been online drama swirling around them. If drama starts in their friend group, or if no one sticks up for them, they may feel all alone and like there is no one on their side. If someone's requesting pictures or passwords, a teen might feel like they'll avoid drama if they comply, but giving in may just kick up more trouble. When, when teens are dealing with drama, here are some ways to help. One of the most effective ways to help teens with online drama is just to listen. If your kid is coming to you seeking understanding, just listening and validating their feelings can let them know that they're not alone, that you care and that you're willing to help if and when they need it. To help your kid avoid starting the drama, help them think through posts when you have a chance. If you see them taking a picture of a friend to post, suggest they ask first. And to do the same before you post pictures of them. If they're trying to work out conflict, encourage them to call or wait until they can talk to the person face to face which will help them avoid misunderstandings. If cyber bill, excuse me, if cyber bullying is happening to your kid, take screenshots 
block the bully, and report them on the site or app. If the bullying persists and your kid is in distress, ask your kid if they want you to intervene. If there's physical threat of some kind, it's time to get the school and or police involved. Preventing drama by being positive, on, being positive online and sticking up for those who are the targets of rumors or bullying also empowers kids and helps them band together instead of drawing out the drama. Sometimes digital drama starts because your kid makes a mistake, like sharing an iffy picture or breaking some rules. So let's dig a bit deeper on how to help without making things worse. No matter what the circumstances, it's good for your kid to know that, that you want them to be safe first and learn lessons later. Try to put anger, shock, and outrage aside and step into support mode. Listen, don't lecture. It's likely that natural consequences will be enough of a lesson. But when the worst is over, it's a good time to reinforce limits. If your kid is being accused, try to reserve judgment. We never want to believe our kids can be mean. But if they hurt someone, accidentally or on purpose, we don't want to jump to their defense out of the gate. Avoid jumping on the phone to another parent or the school. Lead with a listening ear to see if intervention is necessary. Often, kids figure it out on their own with their friends and it leads to a better solution. Depending on your kid, social media and games could either start out as a refuge or end up that way. For some kids, social interaction feels easier online in the context of a game or forum. For others, online relationships and social media can become a way to avoid problems and emotions, which end up isolating them. When kids isolate themselves, it's always a sign of some kind, though it could mean a variety of things. Because the online world is limitless and caters to every interest, kids who have trouble relating to people in real life can find their people online. That sense of belonging is what teens want most. So if it stays uncomplicated and fun, it may become more compelling that in that in-person relationships. Though they're still interacting, it's still a kind of isolation to exclude eye-to-eye -eye contact. If this seems hard to understand, imagine finding a room full of people who seem to have exactly the same interest as you, that you can turn off and on at will and who don't ask anything of you or for gamers. Imagine a perfect world you can explore that has just the right amount of challenge, but no real consequences. You can also liken it to an endless, wonderful book that you never want to put down. Because of some of the other factors we've discussed like pressure and drama, drama. Kids may start to let the digital world take over. They may lose interest in other activities to maintain their online lives. And everything else may feel like an outside distraction. For kids who are dealing with trauma, conflict, or other problems, being online 
can feel like a refuge and a way to avoid their problems. Sometimes this leaves them open to relationships with strangers, which often isolate them even further. Teens who isolate by going online are usually dealing with intense feelings of some kind. They might feel like it's easier to just have friends online since in-person relationships are too difficult for a variety of reasons. They may feel better when they're online because they don't have to feel certain things or deal with problems. They also might feel like they're in too deep if grades have slipped or conflict with parents has started and now <laughs> there's no way out. If a child is already feeling isolated or is avoiding something by being online, it probably means that they're already struggling. So a sensitive approach may usually be best. It might seem best to take away devices if a kid's use feels out of control and they've given up on things they used to love. But if they're using digital media as an escape and a lifeline, it could make things worse. Before taking drastic measures around devices, try to identify the underlying causes of isolation. Is this a familiar pattern with your kid because social interaction has always been hard? Has there been a major life stress? Do you know why your kid has retreated? Are they using a game or social media as temporary escape from difficult circumstances? Within limits, this can actually be helpful if it's contained and temporary. If they won't talk to you about what's going on, it's probably time to get outside help. Short of banning devices, setting some limits around when and where your kid can use them will help contain how much time they're spending online. Eating to get dinner together as a family as much as possible is proven to decrease risks of negative outcomes like substance abuse. So have device-free dinners. Teens are notorious for not getting enough sleep, which can significantly impact their mental health. So keeping devices out of bedrooms helps set limits naturally. If you suspect that your kid is fostering online relationships with strangers, find out more. Are they just chatting in an interest-based forum? Is there someone they would consider special who they feel close to? If so, they may feel very proprietary about that person. Though you want to keep your kids safe, it's also important to tread lightly if you think your kid has feels this person is their only friend. Cutting off all contact in anger or fear might trigger extreme behavior. So staying calm, empathetic, and reasonable will help tap into underlying feelings instead of making the online relationships something to defend. Approach media balance as a family instead of targeting one child, even if that child is the only one who's struggling. Depending on the circumstances, there are gentle approaches to take once you've put some limits around where and when devices are used. Gamer camps and coding classes. If your kid is obsessed with gaming, there's likely a camp that caters to it. They can also play it and interact with like-minded teens face-to-face -face at the same time. If social media is the obsession, gauge their openness to teaching you what's cool about it. Sometimes sharing the fun parts opens up the experience. If that's a no-go, try to get at the root. It's likely fueled by insecurity or anxiety. If your kid has gone through something and is trying to escape, try to balance their isolation gradually with shared experience and low key social gatherings with people who feel safe and are trusted. And no matter what, empathy and validation go a long way. So if you can meet them where they are, they're much more likely to take your hand and cross that bridge. It's really scary to think about your kid wanting to harm themselves. But it's helpful to be armed with information about risk factors 
warning signs and the best way to approach the worst case scenario. How do we know when we really need to worry? Let's go back to what's happening for your kid as a, as a typically developing tween or teen. Here are some characteristics or preoccupations you might see as your kid hits puberty and beyond. Popularity and pecking order. Worried about social status. Growing independence and distancing from family can seem secretive and rebellious. Concern about appearance, especially in the eyes of their peers. What other kids think of them becomes very important. Strong and swinging emotions. Hormonal changes can cause big feelings and quick changes in them. Exploration of sexual identity is a desire to learn about, explore, and take on sexual identities. Trying on different identities. Play with social roles, interests, and beliefs. The lack of consideration for consequences, biologically less able to consider consequences of actions, and more likely to take risks, can feel invincible. What's tricky for parents is that the signs of distress can overlap with what's considered normal behavior for this age group. Kids withdraw and become more secretive. They're more emotional and volatile. Their behavior and identity can shift. So it can be hard to guess what's happening with your kid if they won't tell you. They might be glued to a device in an even more obsessive way than normal and full of angst around it. Or suddenly stop using their phone and try to avoid being online. Duration, if your kid stays upset, anxious and withdraws over the course of a few days, something is happening. While it can be tricky to tell what's actually happening with your teen, these behaviors are typical warning signs that something is really wrong. Self-harm. Cutting, burning, or otherwise inflicting harm on oneself. Suicidal thoughts or ideation. Talk, writing, or references to suicide or having a plan for how to do it giving away personal items, increased withdrawal, quits activities, won't see friends, won't talk or share with family, stays isolated, dropping grades and disinterest, doesn't see the point in applying effort, changes in sleeping and eating, lack of interest in food, overeating, excessive sleeping, or insomnia, increased crying, more despair and weeping about more causes, hidden depression or anxiety, effort to keep a brave face, or not upset anyone because of stigma around showing weakness or imperfection. Here are some other tools you can use to get a sense of how your kid is doing. First, there's the HEADS assessment, which mental health professionals use to determine a teen's mental health status. Here are the pieces parents can use. Home, how are things at home? Have there been any major changes or stresses at home? Education, how are things at school? Changes there, sliding grades, absences, relationships with teachers, getting in trouble. Activities, 
Are they involved in sports or clubs? Are they still attending? Are there any changes in interests or attendance? Drugs, including alcohol and tobacco, new or increased use at home, use by peers, use by your own child, what substance it is and how often. Sexuality, a new sexual relationship, questioning orientation, abuse, possible pregnancy, STD, and risky behaviors. Suicide, depression. Some of what we've explored, withdrawal, sleep disordered, appetite changes, feeling hopeless, emotional outbursts, or suicidal ideation. If it's helpful to have shorthand for this or with your kid around how things are going, you can use a scale from one to 10 like the pain scale they use at the doctor. Anywhere from one to three means things are going pretty well, no major problems. Anywhere from four to six on the moderate range, which means that there's some distress that might be impacting each day, but your kid is still functioning. This is a good time to explore options for getting help before things get worse. Anywhere from seven to 10 is severe, impacting your kid's life on all fronts and requires immediate intervention. It is helpful to know the circumstances that might be an important factor in your kid's overall equation. Most of these may be fairly obvious circumstances that would put you on high alert, but some might be easier to brush off. While risk-taking and making poor choices is somewhat expected among teens, given their brain development, it's good to note and talk about changes you see. If your kid is experimenting with drugs, getting into trouble, and hanging out with new people, that adds up to a cluster of risk factors. And if there's general understanding that therapy or mental health individual intervention of any kind isn't okay, kids may be more reluctant to seek help. If your kid is struggling with sexual orientation or gender issues, it's helpful to acknowledge it and to show love and support even if you have strong feelings about the issue. Teens who are grappling with these issues are about five times as likely to contemplate suicide. So it is a huge risk factor if questioning teens feel unsupported. And if you suspect your kid is struggling, removing access to guns and pills is critical. On the other hand, there are factors that can help shield your kid, even when they are going through hard times. Basically, feeling connected to others, having a support system, and knowing that it's okay to ask for help are all helpful. But again, if your kid is struggling, barring access to lethal means is very important. So what if you've seen some warning signs and your kid is in trouble? The first thing is first. Even though it's scary, it's important to keep your own emotions in check. Coming at your teen with accusations, a need for reassurance, or judgment isn't going to help, and it may shut down the conversation before it ever really starts. Knowing the basics of your kid's life is important. You don't need to track every move or know everything, since teens need some privacy. But knowing their friends and your kid's whereabouts is important. As always, Lead with empathy, empathy and listening. I notice that you've been spending a lot of time alone in your room and haven't wanted to hang out with anyone. It seems like maybe you're going through a hard time. I really want to hear about what's happening with you. If you'd rather talk to someone else, that's okay too. We can do whatever you need. It might feel like you're alone, but you're not. I'm right here with you and I love you very much. If your kid opens up, and wants to talk right away, let them and listen. You probably can't fix the problems for them. So just being there is most important. Depending on the circumstance, you can see if your kid is open to or would like to get some professional help. If they're expressing thoughts of being all alone and feeling helpless, ask if they've ever thought about suicide. Many parents believe that bringing it up might plant the idea in their kid's head but it's better to get it out in the open. If they say yes, and there hasn't been any professional help up to this point, it's time to get some. 
Professional face-to-face -face help is necessary if your kid is in crisis. And there are also digital resources that might be helpful for kids who either only need lower impact support or on the go accessible support. Some of these apps focus on gratitude, some on meditation and others on specific mental health issues. We have a list on our site if you want to read full reviews. Another quick accessible resource is the crisis text line. You text 741-741 to be connected to a counselor at any time, any day. Let's take a moment to exhale. After all that, it might seem like there's no upside in sight. But the truth is, social media and gaming have a lot of potential positives for teens too. Myth or truth, social media alienates teens. Myth, social media can strengthen relationships, can use to do good in the world, reach out to volunteer, create community and be inclusive. Most kids are just having fun, according to Pew Research Internet Project. 57% of all teens have made new friends online. 84% of boys who play network games with friends feel more connected when they play online. 68% of teens social media users have had online friends support them through tough or challenging times. Of course, face-to-face -face social skills are still important. And in terms of how social media affects teens overall, Common Sense's 2018 social media, Social Life Teens Reveal Their Experiences Research paints a fairly positive picture. First, most teens are using social media multiple times each day, which probably isn't surprising to us. The majority of teens, over 70% overall, don't feel better or worse after using social media. Many teens who do feel effects from using social media report positive feelings, but feeling less depressed, less anxious, less lonely, and better about themselves. Our research also shows that kids who additionally report lower social emotional well being are the teens who feel worse after using social media like feeling left out, getting fewer likes, and getting cyber bullied. It seems that these are the kids who feel potentially negative effects of social media the most. As parents, we need to keep a proper perspective. On the one hand, we have concerns about how digital media impacts our kids' mental health, and we're wise to stay mindful and observant. What's also true on the other hand is that neither social media or gaming is inherently bad or harmful. In fact, both can be fun, creative, connective, learning opportunities when used in balance and ideally together. So how do we tap into those positives? With tweens and teens, there's a very fine line between showing interest and invading their space. And we're not always going to get it right, but it's important to keep trying. Tweens and teens often send messages, send the message that they want space and they think we're the worst. So we have to find the balance between giving them some space and letting them know that we're there and we care. Even as they push us away, we need to stay involved despite the eye rolls. 
Do ask questions that are based in curiosity, not judgment. Do ask your kid to teach you about the latest app or game that they love. Keep asking and talking. In the course of our busy lives, it's easy to only pay attention to the logistics of dinner, laundry, and appointments. But deep dives are important. Digital media is ever-changing and requires an ongoing conversation. A lot of what teens are using is actually pretty cool. Sometimes our instinct is to play the old school fuddy-duddy and try to tell kids that what they love isn't great. Instead, have them show you what's cool, why it's cool, and what you might both learn from what they love. There is a reason your kid loves the media that they do. It's fun. We might not see it at first, so we may need our kids to show us why something is fun. Even if it's not our jam, we can show our kids we're willing to give it a chance. They're more likely to be open about what they love in the future. Playing games and using social media together can be a great way to bond. Our goal isn't to take something over and make it ours. Instead, we can let them take the lead, be the teachers, and dip in and out of their domain and stay in touch, but still give them space. On behalf of May and myself, we wanted to thank you all for being a part of our webinar. You'll notice at the top of our screen, there's a bit.ly that we would like you to use, to use that form to fill out, um, to connect with us. Uh, it's a it has a brief survey. It's a one page survey with about four questions on it. And there's a spot for you to ask us more questions or concerns. And if you'd like us to uh, connect with you with more resources, we'll be happy to do that as well. So there's a spot for you to share your email if you want to do that. Again, from the bottom of our hearts, we want to say thank you for being a part of this. Uh, we realize that as parents of kids of our own, that this is the world we, we all inherited and that we're contributing to. And we want to do what's best for our kids. And we want you to do what's best for your kids. And so I'm happy to be part of a county that's made this a priority of connecting with parents and and working with uh, schools to try to, uh, to help kids navigate this, this digital world that we have. So thanks from the bottom of my heart. I want you to realize that the survey looks like this when you go to it. Again, that's the link for it. And like I said, it's a really short survey. It'll probably take you about two minutes to do, but we appreciate you being here and we appreciate you allowing us to work with your kids. And that Thank concludes. you all for coming. Thank you all for tonight, Amay.